Okay, let's now take a look at the Cycles Render Engine. The Cycles Engine is a new render engine that's been included in Blender for the last couple of versions. It's still fairly heavily under development, but it provides a fairly full feature set for the majority of tasks. Uh, it is a node-based, physical-based render engine, and uh, also supports full CPU and GPU rendering. It's progressive, but also the main thing is that it is also allows interactive rendering in the viewport for preview rendering. So first and foremost, let's go ahead and enable it. Uh, to switch over to the Cycles engine, you just need to go up here where you see Blender Render, which means a Blender internal, and we're just going to switch it over to the Cycles Render. When we do that, you'd see our shading system changes a little bit, and our settings over here change to reflect that system. And first and foremost, since I'm doing this interactively, I am going to go ahead and use the GPU rendering so it's a lot faster and you can kind of see what's going on. And if you do not see this setting here for the device between CPU or GPU compute, you simply need to go to your file menu and user preferences, then bounce over to the system side. And at the bottom left of the system side, you sh should have none, CUDA, or OpenCL rendering. Now, something to note is that uh, Cycles has full support for CUDA-based cards, or predominantly NVIDIA cards, and as long as it has, I believe it's shader model 1.3 and up, but I could be wrong. Uh, but if, it, if your card supports it, it should be shown here. You can see CUDA. I've got my two cards in my machine. I'm going to use the GTX 580. And then it also has uh, preliminary support for OpenCL rendering on a, uh, AMD cards, but it is not very complete yet and is only uh, included for testing and development pur purposes. But its development is continuing and should be available in the near future for full rendering. So switching over to CUDA, I'm just going to close this. And the first thing is, is the viewport rendering. So the viewport rendering is very nice for doing interactive uh, preview renders while working on your scene. And you can activate the preview rendering simply by going down here where you see your shading menu and change the viewport shading over to rendered. This will immediately start rendering the scene right in the viewport. You can see it's packing the BVH, including it, and there we have it. So I can now just render directly in the viewport, rotate around, position my view how I want, and it will start rendering progressively. So this is very, very nice. You can see I've got a total path tracing samples. Uh, it's counting up from you know zero to 200 and my elapsed time. Now I don't have any lighting in my scene currently because I did just remove everything that we'd done in the previous video just so we could start fresh. And so the first thing, let's go ahead and set uh, new lighting. So uh, generally when working in cycles, it's helpful to have several views. So I'm just going to split my view and I'll keep one side for rendering, one side for the, the viewport. And let's just add in a lamp. So I'm going to hit Shift A and I add in a lamp. Now, one thing to note is that Cycles does not currently support all of the Blender lamp types. Cycles has support for point lamps, sun lamps, and spot lamps. The point lamps are very, very noisy and tend to cause some problems, and so they're not generally recommended yet. Uh, it's still under development, but the sun lamp and the spot lamps generally work pretty well. So let's go ahead and use the sun lamp. Um, to continue that discussion, the uh, Cycles generally relies on mesh lights predominantly, and so it, you can just use any mesh as an emission surface, and we'll look at that here in just a moment. But immediately setting the sun lamp on, give us our you know, actual shading within our viewport. And just like the Blender internal, it just relies on the orientation as it is a direct light. And we can, or a directional light, I should say. And we can go ahead and rotate this. You can see that it is updating interactively within the 3D view. So this is very, very nice. So let's just rotate that something like that. Okay. And you know, just for an improved render, I might go ahead and add in a mesh and a plane and then just scale that plane way up just to give us a ground floor so that we can see how the shadows are being treated. So first, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the lighting for or lighting settings for our lamp here. So on our lamp, we can go over here. And actually, real quick, before I stop that, um, by default, the samples for the viewport, uh, they can be set via sampling right here. And by default, it, the preview is set to 10. And so if your render is super noisy, that would be why. Uh, oops. By the way, setting it to zero will set it to infinite and it will just keep rendering uh, without stopping. But generally, you know, I'm going to set this to about 200 or so for a decent number of samples for previewing. All right, 
Uh, by the way, you can also pause the render at any time either. You can just close the render by switching into any other shading mode or by pressing pause right here on the right side. Uh, if this is too small, you can just simply scroll this over with your mouse wheel or middle click and drag to move that over. So on our lamp, we can go over to our lamp settings and we can see we've got our different types, same thing as before. We can see the surface. So here we have our settings just like we did in the Blender internal. But as I mentioned before, Cycles is predominantly a node-based system. So let's take a look at the nodes and I'm actually just going to split this down twice and line those two up. You can see it'll snap together because then I can just merge them back over there. And then I'm going to set this view over to my node editor. And the node editor then is going to show me all of the actual nodes for my system. Number one, real quick, you can see your different types of nodes down here between material or shading nodes, uh, texture nodes, compositing nodes, and then two different basically categories of nodes between object nodes, so including materials, textures, and Compo and uh, compositing, and then our world-based shaders for the environment. So this view here in Cycles is merely a basically um, you know an interface view of the node system. So we can see that our surface type is set to emission. So even though it's a lamp, it's still using just the emission type. We can go ahead and set our color if we wanted. Um, you can just use a regular uh, color choice here. Or if you click the dot to the right side, you can then change how that color is uh, driven. So if we wanted to just use a sky texture, we could simply choose sky texture here. That will then influence the color. I then have a little normal dot that I can drag around to change, you know, the basically the angle of the sun within that color that's being affected. Now, this may not be ideal to add to a sunlight, but it is there. If I want to remove that, I just click this again and I can either remove or disconnect. You can see that it's being represented here in the nodes as well. And so if I just remove it, it's going to delete the node. If I disconnect, it merely breaks the connection uh, between these two. So we'll, uh, one thing to note also in Blender is that all nodes are color coordinating. So the out, uh, yellow output here generally is gonna go into a yellow input in the previous node. Yellow represents uh, RGB values, gray represents just value, Green represents a shader input or output, and then blue is a vector input or output. Um, and I'm going to go over each of these different types here in a moment. But that's our basic light. Uh, one thing on the sunlight, if you need to get, increase uh, the sharpness or softness of the shadow, it's merely adjusting the size right here. So setting this down to 0.1 will give us much sharper shadows. All right. We're going to, we can also select our nodes right in here. I'm just going to select my sky texture node and I'm going to hit delete. So let's now actually look a little closer at the nodes themselves. So if we just select any panel here on the car, by the way, you can select directly in this view as well. Uh, let's just select the door or this side panel here. And we're going to go over to the materials and we're going to add a new material. This works the same way. So add a new material. And then let's go ahead and we can see our different settings here. So again, these are represented in the, the nodes are the actual shaders. And then this is merely a, you know, an easier to follow or well, for beginners generally, a easier system to look at real quickly if you want to change a couple things. So we've got our color, we've got our roughness value, uh, and then our surface type. So by default here, we have a diffuse shader. We can go ahead and set this shader to any of our available ones, including a background shader, diffuse, glossy, glass, translucent, transparent, velvet, so on and so forth. If we just go and choose a glassy shader or glossy shader, we can see that our roughness is at zero, so it's perfectly reflective. Increasing this, we'll get you know softer and softer reflections. We have our color value here. And with each of these, we can drive these based on whatever we want. And these points here basically represent these input points for the nodes. So if I drive this via a image texture, it's going to just add an image texture to this node and connect it there. Now it's immediately turned purple to illustrate that I don't have an image loaded in here. But if I were to choose my render result or anything else, now that was a, a poor choice, but that's all right. If I can close that, it'll then show. So if I were to, again, load in, say, uh, that same render that I had before, this label test, it will, by default in Cycles, just use the UV channel so you don't need to worry about loading that in. Uh, you can change your type if you're using an animated or movie texture, then you can choose those. Or if we want to just 
uh, choose a generated texture we can also do that uh, and I'll just generate a, a texture for us now in this case I think that's actually not correct just because it's got one loaded in so let's just click the X and leave that be if we want to disconnect this we can either just select this by left clicking and then hit X or if you want to disconnect it you can either just drag the, the noodle out or hold down control left click and drag and you can cut through that connection so we can just remove that um, with the shaders we have various things so if you hit shift a you can see all of our different options that we can add in here so everything from inputs for inputting ca camera data uh, geometry data light paths uh, if you want to restrict things like such make it invisible to the camera or anything like that you can add in a light path node and see all your different ray types to then uh, mix based on that we can see let's just say if we wanted to add in a or mix two different shaders so maybe we want to mix a glossy with a diffuse we can just choose a diffuse pull this over here and then add in a mix shader and then we can mix these two together by just filling in the dots and just to make this more clear we'll make this blue or something and then we have a factor here that we can mix these two by now you I mentioned that this is a value so if I hit shift a add in an input we can see that I've got a Fresnel value here and I could just choose Fresnel drop that in there connect it and then it will mix based on the Fresnel value same thing if you wanted to add in say a layer weight you can then choose facing and we can mix based on which one's facing the camera more and by how strong that should be so we've got pretty good freedom for how we want to mix things together um, you know if, if we pull in a geometry node then we can pull in say the normal of that node to mix the two uh, we can pull in back facing or anything like that so we've got pretty good control over the way that shaders are done and very very flexible node-based system and assuming that you've used a node-based system before then you ought to be very very comfortable with the way that blender or cycles handles this uh, you can see we've got color nodes vector nodes for normals or mapping textures for all of our different types of textures including image environment or procedural textures as well that's about it uh, you can also well yeah that's about it for the actual node shaders you know I'm not going to get into this too much and again that's you know on you to then take it the next to the next step but one thing I do want to look at real quick is the environment so if we switch over here to the world settings we can see that we've got fairly minimal control initially uh, but we do have our background we've got the color of the background and then ambient occlusion so if we were to say enable ambient occlusion you can see it's added in we can change down the factor or the distance for it it's way down or way up um, take the factor down so you can just adjust this right on the fly I'm just gonna disable it for the time being uh, we can then if we want to input a sky background we can just click this influence it via the sky texture and that will add that in giving us again the same normal dot the turbidity setting and then the vector by default the vector is just the environment uh, and speaking of the environment you notice that we can't see anything because we have a transparent background here there is a setting uh, in the render properties if you want under the film section you can find transparent and that will just include whether or not to render the background or not in, with transparency for doing post-processing and things like that and we're gonna look a little bit more at each one of these here in a moment but let's first go back to our world settings so if we wanted to not use a sky texture but wanted to use an HDRI probe or anything like that then we would want to change this instead to an environment texture and then simply click open choose textures and or well texture in this case is relative and I have an HDR here I can just load that in and it will just automatically set it to the environment and there we have it so you can see it's already showing up in the 3d view now do note that uh, HDR images do not show up in orthographic mode so if you, if you don't see it then you just need to be in perspective mode uh, we then can set the mapping type so it supports rectangular and mirror balls and we do also have the strength of the environment here all right so that's the real quick environment uh, let's switch over to the render settings here and take a look at a few things just to get you up and going number one we've got the same thing you know dimensions output those are the same as the blender internal things that are different we've got our sampling options whether or not to use progressive or not now do note that progressive uh, is the only one supported in the uh, on the GPU 
If you want to use the other one, you need to switch over to the CPU. So I'm just going to switch back to wireframe, switch to CPU, and then you can see that we have either progressive or non-progressive, which then allows us to set our various samples specifically based on the type of path. Now, in this case, I'm just going to switch back to progressive, choose the GPU, and set this back to rendered. Okay. So then in our progressive, then we have a seed sample. So this is for the noise seed. So if you're rendering across multiple machines, you can set various seeds and then mix those two together to reduce the noise if you want. We have a clamp option that allows you to clamp pixels at a specific value. So in, say anything over one will be, re, uh, will be clamped. And this is helpful for removing fireflies from your render. Um, Cycles is pretty good about fireflies, but sometimes they can be a little pesky. Uh, particularly if you're using a point lamp, then you tend to get more fireflies. Uh, and so clamping can be valuable. We've got our render samples. So how, much to, how many samples to include at render time for rendering here? Uh, or in the viewport preview, how many samples you want? Next, we also have light paths. And the light paths allow us to set the number of uh, samples or bounces basically between various uh, passes. So for example, how many transparency bounces, how many bounces total. So our maximum bounces here controls all of these. So, you know, how many diffuse glossy transmission bounces should we have for adjusting and fine tuning the quality and speed. Uh, we do have a couple of presets for direct light, full global illumination or limited global illumination that then adjust those as needed. Uh, whether to enable or disable shadows for rendering uh, for tr or transparency of surfaces for rendering shadows, and then also whether or not to render caustics or not. Uh, if we enable it, you know, obviously we're going to get caustics, but we're also going to get less noise uh, if we turn it, turn it off. And then filter glossy is another kind of uh, speed hack of sorts. It, it will lose accuracy as you increase this, but basically, as you can see by the tooltip, it adaptively blurs the glossy shaders after a blurry bounce. So if a, if a light ray hits a blurry surface and then bounces off, that glossy shader will then be blurred a little bit uh, to reduce noise in those areas. And you, it's not generally noticeable in the details, but for, you know, more larger surfaces or things like that that are receiving a lot of noise, it can be very good for reducing it there. For next, we do have also the film option, which is where we set the transparent shader. We can set our exposure, um, our filter type, and then also we have performance options. So with performance, again, we have threads and tiles here, but then we also have the acceleration structure for the dynamic or static BVH. Dynamic allows you to build the BVH once and then even move an object around. So if you have an animated object, uh, then you would want to use the dynamic. Whether or not to use spatial splits, uh, I honestly can't tell you what this does, uh, but it generally will result in slightly faster rendering, but also a longer build time. So if you have a lot of geometry in your scene, then you may not want to do that depending on what you're rendering. And then also whether or not to cache the BVH. So if you're rendering a camera animation, you would want to cache the BVH across your scenes so that you build it once and then just render. Lastly, then, we also have the layers, which is the render layers, again, for doing post-production and render passes and such, uh, but we'll look at that in one of the final chapters.